When we think of cities and we think of places, even when we're reading scripture, we tend to overlay our view upon the cities. Today we're going to talk about Ephesus and Corinth. You need to understand that discrete houses with distance between houses and privacy within enclosed doors did not exist. Houses, if they had windows, did not have glass, did not have wood to cover them at night. You had, a, if at best, a little scrap of cloth. Anything set inside could be heard outside because the street was there. And within a couple of feet, at most, is another house with other windows. And people are moving all the time. Crowded, narrow, twisted ways. There were very, very few avenues. In Rome, they had some avenues. But in other places, they did not. Therefore, everything was heard. People moved. There was no privacy as we know it today. And as we've taken this journey into what our Bible is and what it is not, and how to read it and how not to read it, I hope that you've taken that journey with us. If not, I do ask that you go back to May 26th and that you start with part one and that you ride with us all the way through part 11. Today is part eight. Then we're going to take a break with one sermon from our brother on death row, Bobby Hampton. And then we're going to start a series talking about what happens after we die. What does the Bible really say? And if you're thinking, oh good, finally something that's going to make me comfortable that I know about. No, no, probably not. But I do believe it will make you love God more. If you know more. But that's later. We've seen in the series that... In the Bible, God elevates women far beyond any culture in which we find ourselves. Bronze Age, Iron Age, wherever we are, whether it's in the Middle East uh, as we know it, or whether it's in Egypt, or whether it's in Rome, he elevates women, and God uses women. They're in Scripture as prophets, apostles, uh, and yes, we'll get to that next week in particular, deacons and teachers. We even see Jesus making it very, very obvious, open, and public that he respected women. Even, and sometimes especially, when the women were women that religious people scorned as unworthy and sinners. When we come upon then two verses in 1 Corinthians and a couple of verses in 1 Timothy, we're shocked at what seems to be a sudden and harsh reversal. Well then... As Scott McKnight would tell you, if you see a blue parakeet in the backyard, you need to understand that's unusual. And you need, unless you're living in Australia or something, and you might need to pay attention to the unusual. We need to find out why they're there, what to do with them. We don't ignore them. We go deeper. In our river of faith, passages of these are like rocks. If you don't watch out, they can gut the bottom of your boat and you can sink your faith. But when we know there are rocks in the river or in the lake or in the ocean, we put up lighthouses. It's rather like our logo here. We put up lighthouses to make sure we know where they are. But now we need to look at why they're there. If you've read your New Testament, this may not be a surprise to you, but I really think we need to emphasize it. Most of the letters written to the churches were written to churches in crisis. In fact, in Paul's letters, 20% of the words by word count are dealing with actual crises in the church. Not small problems like, you know, do we carpet the assembly? But we're talking huge problems, such as can a man marry his father's wife? Can, you know, can our people here... Uh, believe in other gods? Can they worship other gods? Can I have huge problems. 20% of his words were dealing with those things. And in fact, when we come to Timothy and Titus, far more, a, a far greater percentage of his words are used to deal with crises. Why? Because Timothy was in Ephesus and Titus was in Crete. Now, a lot of our house church people here at the soundstage are actually on the road. They're traveling right now. 
or, or they are um, quarantining because of you know, cancer treatment or the like. Therefore, we're not a full house. However, in the first couple of centuries, had I said, because Timothy was in Ephesus, you would have heard the crowd go, oh. And if I said Titus was in Crete, they would have gone, oh, yeah. They got it. We don't get it. We think of Ephesus. We think of great, you know, these great temples that are, the ruins are still with us today. In fact, if you live around us, Nashville even has a copy of the Parthenon. It's not a full-size copy. I don't think they were planning for it to be around forever, but it was a hit. So it's there still today. And you can still walk in and see the gods and goddesses portrayed as they were. And we think of that, but we don't think of, that was a bad place to live. And Crete as an insane place to live. The churches in those regions were under assault. It amazes me that people in the West can feel that the religion is under assault because they don't want us to talk about God in schools or let us pray in schools or they won't let a bell ringer in front of a store. Friends, that's not the same as being thrown to the lions. It's not the same as being denied work. It's not the same as, not, as having your children not being allowed to be educated because they are Christian. Ephesus was one of those places that was under siege by false teachers, secular authorities, pagan culture that was aggressive, and more. And to the point where your job, your school, being able to shop or go to a sporting event, all was based upon and reliant upon your agreeing with the pagan culture of the place. It was awful. And the churches were under assault by goddess worship and Gnosticism. It was an early form of Gnosticism, often called proto-Gnosticism. If you don't know what that is, we'll get into it a little bit. You don't want to get into it a lot because it will give you headaches and we are not responsible for your medical care. But Gnosticism and the goddess worship were open, declared enemies of the church and went after the believers of the church. Anywhere they were strong, the church was under attack and you could lose your job, your freedom, your ability to live within the city because they could banish you like that. All because these teachings were that powerful. And so as Aura read for us today in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, he says, don't you command people, don't teach false doctrines anymore. Don't devote yourself to myths don't devote yourself to endless genealogies. Don't devote yourself to controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of the command is love. Pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith. That's what we do. Don't turn from that to meaningless talk. Think of how much better a witness the church would be if we just obeyed that part. Then instead of going into genealogies and endless speculations, that we just, from a pure heart, loved people. That's what Paul says you're supposed to do. Verse 7, he said, these other people, they want to be teachers of the law, but they don't know what they're talking about. They don't understand what they confidently affirm. That's what was going on in Ephesus, because that's where Timothy was. That's why this book was written. Ephesus was the center of goddess worship. This is an incomplete list of the, the female gods that were being worshipped in Ephesus. One was called the great mother of the gods. The other, the mountain mother. There was Bologna. There was Sibyl. There was Demeter. And there was Diana, also known in the ancient world as Artemis but we're not going to always do the also known. We're just going to call her Diana. Many of us know that name because of problems in Acts where people rioted yelling, great is Diana of the Ephesians to shut down the early believers and even drive them from town. All of these pagan cults taught things. We know this because they left enough records for us to know this. They all taught that a female God created the world. They, a female God created the first human being, a perfect female. They went further 
and taught that a lesser God, now how that lesser God came about, that's where they differed. That's where you had denominations. Um, there were battles that created one, explosion. They were all m- mistakes. Mistakes or acts of violence created a lesser God who created then man. And he wasn't made very well. It was he, they taught, who sinned. And by his folly ruined the female paradise. By the way, some echoes of this still occur. I can remember when uh, long ago, in in the early 80s, around 1980, uh, they they first were able to um, duplicate a sheep in Scotland, if you remember. The first time they were able to take cells from one creature and actually make a copy And they were going, yay. And I'm going, yeah, great. We know how to make sheep. We have sheep. You know, we have a lot of sheep. What's what's the deal? Some feminist scholars started saying, now we have no need for men. Because we can reproduce without them. As if men were a problem. Some men are. I'll grant you. Some women are. But that's not the point. The The idea was there is a lesser human being that must be controlled. And therefore, even our schools uh, in the West are taught on a female s- system of learning where you sit in rows and you all listen and you do the, instead of the boy way of doing it, which is pretty much chaos and handling it and picking it up and learning and running and figuring it out. We have demoted the male even in our sitcoms or our commercials, who's the idiot? It's always the male authority. The father authority is always the idiot. It is, um, and it, it's tragic, but it's ongoing. They were standing the story of Adam and Eve on its head, and that's what Gnostics still do. By the way, just a little data point, Wonder Woman was created by a psychiatrist who believed that women paradise would be best. He was a male, so I'm not really sure how he rationalized this. But he, he went with the whole Amazon idea that there was this mythical uh, civilization run only by women in the Amazon. Well, he moved it to Greece or something like that. But the whole point was that's why they're powerful and the last thing they need is a guy in there to spoil everything. Well, we get a glimpse of this. In Acts 19, rather, when we see what believers went through, where Timothy was. The city was full of books of magics and myths and fanciful tales, taking bits and pieces from Scripture. Yeah, Jewish Scripture as well. New Testament hadn't been written. From pagan religions, from their own imaginations. And they they wove these all together to make new religions. When Paul tried to preach there, a riot broke out and they would have killed him. Had it not been for the authorities gaining control of the mobs and then demanding that the local believers put up money as a, as a surety bond. In other words, you can live here, but we're going to tax you differently and you're going to have to put up damage for whatever we do to you. The mother, of, the, uh, mother goddess religion did not brook competition. And it still doesn't. Paul was driven from the city, but he kept in touch with others that were still working there. He sent them warnings about the myths that were surrounding them and being taught as reality. In Acts chapter 20, verses, uh, let's just do 28 through 30. Keep watch over yourself and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. It was a dangerous place to be a believer. He wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, by the way, um, that, that whole area that we sometimes ignore because we just look at 14. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, he, he tells him, I have to stay here. You know, there, are, there are problems in verses 8 and 9. Um, but I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work is open to me and there are many who oppose me. 
He says, I've got a chance here to do something good. These were not his usual opponents. His usual opponents were a portion of the Jews who believed that they believed in Christ, many of them, but many of them did not. But the whole idea was, no, he's misleading people away from our faith, therefore we've got to attack Paul. Many of them had even sworn to kill him. Those were his usual opponents, but not this time. It was Gnostic and goddess worshipers. Now that you know that, look at 1 Timothy again. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, people are teaching myths. Verses 6 and 7, they're speaking confidently about things they don't understand. They were trying to use the Jewish law, verse 8, but they were doing it wrong. Verse 19 and 20, they had lost contact with Jesus, the center and anchor of our faith. Now, or we did not assign Ora to read down that far. So 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting at, let's go, um, let's start at verse 18. We'll back up a bit. Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by receiving them you might fight the battle well. There's a fight going on in Ephesus. One like you and I have never fought, and most likely will never see fought. Because you can't, you can't do anything in Ephesus without everybody knowing. Again, think of the warren of streets, the, em- the, the empty window frames, empty door frames as well. Normally, you did not have a wooden door unless you were rather well off. It would me- merely be another strip of cloth. They heard everything. They saw if you did not make the oath of allegiance to Diana, let's say, or the, the mountain mother... If you were going to a sporting event, they did that. In America, it throws off some Europeans, by the way, because there are very few parallels to this, um, that before a sporting event, people will stand for the national anthem. And a lot of Europeans or or Asians or the like are thrown off by that, because that's not done at their sporting events. Well, it is here. There, it would have been a standing and everybody pledging allegiance to the mother goddess or to Diana, or to Bologna, or one of the others. They would know if you did or didn't. When you signed a contract, there was a prayer to the the goddesses. If you did not sign a contract because of that, they knew. And you might not get the contract, you might not get the job. This was war against the believers. What happens... Holding on to faith with a good conscience, I've got ahead of myself, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, who I've handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. So there were men that did this as well, that taught this entire concept. In fact, most of the things we know about the Gnostics we get because men wrote it down. Or, well, I'll get to that. I want to talk about shipwreck. They've made shipwreck. They've suffered shipwreck. Other versions say they have shipwrecked the faith. The word used there doesn't have a direct English translation. It means they've slipped their anchor in the marina or the harbor. And therefore their boat is being shoved around running into other boats. It is banging and wrecking other boats. It's damaging other boats. They've lost their anchor, which is Christ. They've tried to find another anchor, and there is no anchor but Christ. Who were these people? While Gnosticism was still in its infancy, there was a philosophy already developing that said only those enlightened could see the truth. Gnosticism comes from gnosis, which means knowledge. Those of us who have special knowledge, we all know that every country has its elites, the elite colleges, the elite universities, the elite members of government, the elite thinkers. And very often they think of themselves as above the common people. Well, this goes further and says, we have knowledge that others do not have. It is special knowledge. It is hidden knowledge. And because we have this knowledge, we are special. We can see the truth. Now, they didn't leave a lot of books behind for us. Some of that is because later Christians destroyed them. But we know a lot about them from two main sources. One, Christians writing against them. Those books 
are still here and they describe the thoughts. But also in the 1940s, the, a huge library was found as they were digging for something else uh, at Nag Hammadi of many books, most of which or many of which were Gnostic books. Now, those are not hidden. You can go buy copies of the books. I will tell you they're a hard slog. And for a guy that loves to read, to tell you that these are hard to read because they're just strange, that's saying something. Because I read strange stuff. And I'll go, well, that's strange. But I get what they're going for. Gnosticism had two parallel thoughts that were in contradiction. One, the body was made by an inferior god, the one that made man. Therefore, the body is bad. Therefore, the body must be punished. Or, same time, because the body is bad and we know pure truth, whatever we do with the body doesn't matter. So get drunk as much as you want to, sleep with whoever you want to, just enjoy a very hedonistic lifestyle. Now, how you can hold both of those at the same time they did. That's why I'm saying it's strange. In some of their writings, Satan is portrayed as the hero. And Jesus is portrayed as the evil brother of the good Satan. Their literature also taught that there were more than one God. There was a God who created woman and paradise. And she's the superior one to the one who made man and earth. All Gnosticism is based on the concept of a superior and an inferior God. Sometimes superior gods and inferior gods. That is, that is what Paul was referring to in 1 Timothy 6, by the way. Uh, I hope that nobody else gets this problem, but in 6, uh, 1 Timothy 6, verse 20 and 21, I'll read this and then I'll come back to it. Timothy, guard, this is how he closed, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed, and in so doing have departed from the faith. God be with you all. The older versions, King James and the like, used another word for knowledge, which back then just meant knowledge. They would say, turn away from what is falsely called science. And I grew up me being told what that meant was science about anything, you know, about evolution or about anything else is just, that's what the Bible's talking about here. No, it isn't. It's talking about the goddess worship and Gnosticism. That's where they were. The Gnostics taught that the resurrection never occurred because why would you resurrect a body that is evil or meaningless? Why would you want it back? That's why Paul goes into a long argument in 1 Corinthians right after talking about some of the things women were teaching in chapter 14. In chapter 15, he goes into a long argument in defense of the resurrection. It's not a coincidence. It's part of the same. He's trying to correct what is being taught. By the way, Corinth was also a center. Ephesus was the lead, but Corinth was not far behind. Knowing what was taught by women in Ephesus and Corinth helps us make some sense about the rocks we've hit in 1 Timothy. But 1 Timothy 2 is not the only place you hit those rocks. Have you ever read the book, really? 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 11 through 15 seem offensive. Because he's talking about putting people on a list to receive food, money, support. And then he says, as for younger widows, don't put them on such a list. For when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus they bring judgment on themselves because they've broken their first pledge. <sighs> this is where some people grab this rock. And they decide virginity is superior to marriage, which is not what Jesus taught. He said God created in the beginning that for a man to leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and they become one flesh. Paul is talking about in a particular place, a particular problem, a particular teaching. 
He goes, besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. Not only do they become idlers, but also busybodies who talk nonsense, saying things they ought not to say. So I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Now, this sounds very offensive to modern ears, does it not? Can we not admit that? Except Paul wasn't saying you're a bad person if you're a widow who's not remarried. At the, those w- young widows who were receiving this teaching and going about busybody were teaching it's a higher thing for women to have nothing to do with men, not to have children. On Twitter, you see people celebrating that they have no children. Therefore, they don't have to save for colleges. They don't have to do all the other. And we're much happier for it. And you'll see articles out there which incorrectly say that those without children are happier. By the way, if you take a look at the data, it doesn't show that at all. But it's been in the Washington Post and the New York Times. And people read those things and they don't read the data. They just read what turns out to be a synopsis with a uh, viewpoint, and they think that's the truth. So Paul also, his warning to, um, to Timothy in a second letter, Timothy was still at Ephesus, in um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, these are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women. Paul was not a woman hater. We can prove that. Hang on for next week who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Why did he pick on women? Because the goddess worship was what was being taught. It was the problem. The raising of one sex above another. Jesus certainly didn't do that. I think it's arguable that he gave a lot more compliments in public to women. I think you could absolutely prove that point. But he never said anywhere that women are superior to men or vice versa. And didn't treat them in that way. These rocks are there because of what was going on in Ephesus. To take these things and then to try to make them rules for everybody. Ripping them out of their context. And ignoring all of the other Bible passages about women and leadership and their value. Is it's wrong. And it's hurtful. By the way, John the Revelator in in Revelation chapter 2 verses 20 through 25 warns a congregation saying, you've got a Jezebel there who is creating a congregation of Satan right in your midst. He wrote that to a city that was saturated with this teaching. To correct their upside down teaching on Eve and Adam and the fall of mankind, 1 Timothy 2 Verses 13 and 14, he says, Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Now, we've already seen, we've mentioned it before, that Paul phrases this in different ways elsewhere. We're going to get to that in just a moment. So take a a breath. In chapter 2, he is trying to correct the basic teaching of the Gnostics and the goddess worshipers. No, Adam was created first. Eve was then created. Eve is the one who took the fruit first. The tales they were telling from house to house were loosing people from their anchor, Jesus Christ, and causing people to lose sight of Jesus, the unity of the church, and the fact that in Paul's own words in Galatians 3.24, now there is no more Jew and Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for we are all one in Christ. We've mentioned before, and here we go to it, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, he talks to men about being peaceful and quiet. This is the same word he uses for women being quiet in verse 12. Why it's translated different is because people just did. Men did. And we're going to talk about some of the more egregious examples of that next week. By the way, when Peter uses that same word in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4, it is translated meek and quiet spirit. 
In 1 Thessalonians 4 and 11, it calls believers to a life that is orderly and constructive. It never means dead silent. It means to comply with the law. It means to live in harmony with your neighbors. Something in in Ephesus is keeping these people, and also in Corinth, from living these sweet, gentle lives we're all called to live. Paul says it's a lack of knowledge masquerading as a wealth of knowledge. He calls all of us, men and women, back to the truth. And what is the truth? It's right here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. For there is one God, there is one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. And this has now been witnessed. That's our God. So now we know why the rocks were there. We know what was going on in Ephesus. In our society, there are hints, there are rumors, there are myths that are being taught. But we're not Ephesus of 2,000 years ago. We're not Corinth of 50 AD. We are not receiving those warnings and having to adjust because of them. We can read the rest of the scriptures where women are elevated as well as men Saved, made in the image of God, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We can lay down our weapons. We don't have to fight each other. We, because I married a designer, we, we watch a lot of HGTV. It's the law. <laughs> and there's always that little play of, well, if mama's not happy, nobody's happy. Always a play of, well, the real boss is... We all understand that. Men want women to be happy. They work hard trying to... Good men want women to be happy. And they work hard trying to make sure the woman is happy. We will never be who the woman wants us to be because we can't be a woman. And therefore, we won't think like her. But we will try to make her happy. The woman is exactly the person a man needs. It is... A symbiotic relationship that is beautiful and equal and perfect. That's what God teaches. Therefore, we do not look at two passages and say, Welp, let's throw out the rest of the scripture. Next week, we're going to take a look at the lengths that some people have gone to to make their low estimation of women a reality. And it's not going to be pretty and it's going to bother some people. I already know it does. I do get the drive-bys every week. One person made a drive-by comment this, I think maybe two weeks ago, uh, about when I said Phoebe was a deacon because it said so in Romans 16, right there, saying, well, this is a specious argument. It completely ignores the requirements listed in Timothy. Tell Paul. He's the one who wrote it. And whenever I said she's the only person expressly called a deacon in the Bible, I meant it. But you're going to get this. Because some people will not read the whole Bible. Somebody will not know, people will not know the background. And therefore they grab text out. And please remember what we've said repeatedly. A text without context is a pretext. Get your context. As for now, deep breath. Do you have to know everything about Ephesus and Corinth? Do you have to know everything about the Lord's Supper, the ways to give? Do you have to under... No. You have to know Jesus. Anchor to Jesus. Because if you don't, as we have seen in our lives and in the lives of people that they just throw out there on TikTok and Twitter and Discord and the like, you're a boat just bashing other boats. And God has called us to live gentle, peaceful, quiet and productive lives. That is our answer to the chaos of this world because we are saved and we will act accordingly. May God give us the strength, the wisdom, and the courage to not judge the world, but to live in such a way that our love shows them there is another way to live. Love them 
until they ask you why. And then talk about the anchor for your soul. May God give us peace.